ladies and gents, this is the physics practice IA number two. And in this IA, this test is pretty much going to cover a majority of forces with a little bit of universal gravitation and circular motion. So we're in that weird in between state of two units. But anyway, most of this is going to be forces, so a lot of this should be repetitive, especially for my kids that we just tested. And we start with number one. Here we have a box with two forces F1 and F2 on opposing sides. Here it says that F1 is greater than the magnitude is greater than F2 and F2. Okay, Ooh. Okay. so we start with F1 is greater than F2, and we can even see that with the arrows being longer on F1. So if that's greater on one side, then it's going to accelerate in the direction of the bigger side, and that's choice C. Accelerating in the direction of F1 if it were the same on both sides, then we would be looking at equilibrium constant speed with no given side, actually. Anyway, number two. Here we have two masses, both seven kilograms each. They're separated by a distance of two meters. We are figuring out the magnitude of the gravitational force exerted between them. So it's the same either way, A and B. Um, because of Newton's third law, but we are looking for the magnitude, so we need to calculate it. Alright, so for number two, when calculating it, we have to use this equation. Universal gravitation equation. Okay. Make sure you set it up. Make sure you know how to use the E button on the calculator. 6.67 to the negative 11 times a mass of 7 kilograms times the mass of the other one also 7 kilograms divided by the radius which is the distance between them and that's 2 meters and don't forget to square it in the denominator all right so that's how you set it up if you calculate this correctly you should get an answer of 8.17 times 10 to the negative tenth newtons. Okay. And that will give us choice C. Okay. So reading the problem, make sure you know what variables they correspond to. That's seven kilograms. Distance here is R. All right. Now number three. Here we have a truck going down a ramp. Oh, actually it's at rest. Okay. What is the component of the truck's weight parallel to the hill. So parallel meaning it's going along the hill. That we call FG parallel, so we need to calculate that. We need to remember which one is parallel because this is not on the reference table. And that's sine. Sine goes down the incline. FG parallel is equal to FG times sine theta. Because they gave this to us, the weight in newtons, this is Fg. Okay. Equals Fg sine theta, so Fg is 100,000 newtons times the sine of 8 degrees. Plug and chug, and you should get, this is about 14,000. Newtons, and this is about, in scientific notation, 1.4 times 10 to the 4th Newtons. That's choice C. Okay. Number 4, which quantity is a vector? So we can already eliminate choice A and B because we have not talk about, talked about either one. So we're left with C and D. Speed we've already established earlier in the year as a scalar. Think S and S, speed scalar. Its counterpart is velocity vector. So those two can go together. Remember that speed is a scalar, how fast you're going. Weight is the only one we've talked about this unit specifically, and that's a vector. So weight has direction, points downward. Okay, number five. Which situation describes an object that has no unbalanced force acting on it? So no unbalanced means it's balanced. That means equilibrium. So when we're in equilibrium, we have to think two things, two states. 
and that's either at rest or constant velocity. Okay. And so we look at our choices, and the only one that fits is choice C, either at rest or constant V velocity. Okay. When a 12 newton horizontal force is applied to a box on a horizontal tabletop, the box remains at rest. Rest, as we talked about in the previous problem, meaning it's at equilibrium. So we apply 12 newtons this way. When it's at rest, equilibrium, that means that 12 newtons is balanced out by another force, and that's friction. The force of static friction opposing our motion is also 12, because it's at rest, equilibrium. Okay. Which quantity is a scalar? So we talked about that in the previous problem. Back in number four, scalar is only magnitude, so how much it has. We have not talked about momentum, but FYI, it's a vector that has direction. Force, we could push or pull. That implies direction. Acceleration also has direction. We talked about that previously. And that leaves us with mass. This is the one to definitely know in our unit for a scalar. Because you can't change the amount that something has. Mass stays the same. Unless you lose an arm. You can only have mass or you don't have mass. Either you have it or you don't. Alright, number 8. Number 8 here, a 400 newton girl standing on a dock exerts a force of 100 newtons on a 10,000 newton sailboat as she pushes it away from the dock. How much force does the sailboat exert on the girl? So girl exerts a force of this on a boat. Okay, girl to boat is 100. The so girl pushes boat with 100. We're looking for boat to girl. This is also 100. Regardless of how much they weigh, 400 or 10,000, they're both going to exert the same force on each other because based on Newton's third law, equal and magnitude opposite direction. Two interacting objects, girl and the boat, push on each other. It's the same force. They'll only accelerate differently because of their masses and their weights. So it doesn't really matter here how much mass they have. The only thing that matters here is that they're both pushing on each other with the same magnitude force. Okay, number nine. An eight newton block is accelerating down a frictionless ramp inclined at 15 degrees to the horizontal as shown in the diagram below. What is the magnitude of the net force causing the acceleration? So our block is accelerating down the ramp, which means there's a force here down the ramp, and that's FG parallel. There's no friction. FF doesn't exist on the other side. We have weight broken down to FG parallel and FG per perpendicular. Perpendicular is balanced out by the normal force. So this direction, up and down right here, is already accounted for. They're balanced. The only thing that's unbalanced causing the acceleration is FG parallel. Sine goes down the incline. So we gotta figure that out with FG sine theta. 8 newtons times sine 15. Oh, let me write this elsewhere. 8 newtons times sine of 15 degrees. Choice B, 2.1 newtons. There we go. That's the end of this first page. Number 10 is a tricky one that I can write you guys on the test. Here we have a rubber clock weighing 60 newtons resting on a surface of dry asphalt. What is the magnitude of the minimum force needed to start moving? So right now it's still at rest and it needs to move. So for number 10, I'm going to do over here, we have a block, 60 newtons, so that 60 newtons is the weight, because it's newtons. Okay. 
This weight is the same as our normal force. We need to figure out this force to start it moving, and because it's at rest, which means it's at equilibrium. That means this force that we're trying to push with is being balanced out by friction. And we need to figure out what force is needed to overcome this friction. We need to figure that out. So if we find F friction force, we find F. Okay. So based on this, because it's at rest, these two are related, and we need to figure out what FFF is, and this is the equation that will allow us to find that. Okay. Mu, we need to look up on the reference table. Alright, so now we got this reference table right in front of us. We are looking at rubber on dry asphalt. And because our object's at rest, we are using 0.85 for our static coefficient because the object's at rest. So that's why we use static. 0.85 is our mu. So I'm going to get rid of this for a moment. Okay. And now we continue. 0.85 is our mu. 0.85 times our normal force of 60 newtons. F of F is then equal to 51 newtons. Choice C. Okay. Next is number 11, a block weighing 10 newtons is on a ramp inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. A 3 newton force of force of friction acts on the block as it is pulled up the ramp at constant velocity with a force F. So we need to figure out what F is. So because this is constant, we think equilibrium. So F is balanced out by force of friction. So wait, can we just assume it's three? But none of these choices show choice three. I mean, show three newtons. So we can't say choice, so we can't say three newtons. My God, I can't English right now. Anyway, that means there's some other force there to make it greater than three. That's FG parallel. So FG parallel is still existing here. So F, force of friction, plus FG parallel should equal F. We need to find what FG parallel is. So number 11, I'm going to do right here, off to the side. FG parallel sine goes down the incline. FG sine theta. I'm going to pause and do the work for you. All right, so... We get that FG parallel, we take our weight of 10 newtons, multiplied by sine 30 degrees, which is the angle of the ramp, and you get 5 newtons. 5 newtons is FG parallel. So that means we have 3 and 5 together being balanced out by F. So 3 plus 5 is 8. And that's our answer. Choice, oh, looks like I'm erasing it. Choice B. Okay, number 12. A 65 kilogram astronaut, that's our mass, weighs 638 newtons, so that's Fg, at the surface of the Earth. What is the mass of the astronaut on the moon? Where the acceleration due to gravity is 1.62 meters per second squared. Okay, so mass doesn't change, but weight does because of gravity. And mass is measured in kilograms. So if the guy's mass is 65 on Earth, it should also be 65 kilograms on the moon. It doesn't change. The one that does change is the weight. So it's choice B. All right, number 13, a carpenter hits a, ha hits a nail with a hammer. Okay, nail and hammer. Compared to the magnitude of the force the hammer exerts on the nail, what is the force that the nail exerts on the hammer? Okay, so we're looking at hammer to nail, and then hammer, oh, and then nail the hammer. So same force because of Newton's third law different accelerations. That's the only thing that changes here. Acceleration is different based on their mass and their force. 
So we are keeping the same force that will be the same between both objects. Okay. Number 14, two 20 newton force act concurrently, that means at the same time, on an object. What angle between these forces will produce a resultant force with the greatest magnitude, so the greatest value? We are trying to put these two forces together to create the biggest net force, biggest acceleration. And so if we look at this right here, they're both 20 newtons in this case. So if you have them on opposite ends, this here is 180 degrees, then you will get them to cancel out. So what we ideally want is them on the same side. We want these two to be on the same side, 20 and 20 together make 4, I mean sorry, 40. So we want this to be as big as possible. And when they're on the same side, that there is an angle of 0 degrees. And that is our answer, choice A. 0 degrees, they're on top of each other, they're on the same side, and when two things are on the same side, they add up. They're both pushing in the same direction. That's what it means. Okay, number 15. Yay, circular motion! Okay, number seven, oh, sorry, 15. We are looking to see what is the direction of the hammer if it's being released at that point. So it's moving around clockwise. The person is getting ready to throw the hammer. Hopefully nobody's in the way. Otherwise, they're going to lose some capabilities in their body, some function in their body. All right. Um, so if we release it at this point, we're talking about velocity. It will travel where? So we're talking about velocity. It's going to leave in a straight point going up. It's tangent. So velocity is tangent to the circle. So in this case, it's going up towards B because it, it's going clockwise. If we're talking about counterclockwise in the other direction, then it will go down towards D. But since we're clockwise, it goes up to B. C and A are talking about towards the middle or away from the middle. So centripetal force and acceleration, both of those will be towards A because it's center seeking. But that, that's, a, that's off topic. We're talking about velocity here. Okay, number 16. Let me pick a different color. All right, now we got two forces, F1 and F2, applied as shown. What is the mass of the block if you have two unbalanced forces? So 12 and 2 are on opposing sides, so we need to figure out that its net force is equal to their difference of 10 newtons. Let me use a darker green. There we go. So if F net is equal to 10 newtons, then we're going to use F equals MA. Oh, I don't have any more room. Okay, so using F net equals mass times acceleration. 10 newtons equals our mass times 2. 10 divided by 2 will get us 5 kilograms. Okay. Number 17. As the angle is increased, what happens to the coefficient of kinetic friction so we need to be careful when you see coefficient we are talking about mu mu doesn't change unless you change the material so this changes with material we are not changing that we're only changing the incline and that has no effect whatsoever and so our mu will stay the same All right, number 18 a 60 kilogram physics student would weigh 1560 newtons on the surface of planet X. What is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of planet X? Okay, acceleration due to gravity means we are looking for G. They give us the mass and the weight. Okay, so we're going to use Fg equals m times G for this one. So for number 18. G equals n times g, f g. We have a radius fifteen sixty equals sixty kilograms times g. 
g is then equal to much bigger than earth because this is a lot heavier so we are looking at choice d 26 meters per second squared okay if you do 1560 divided by 60 you should get 26 as your answer okay number 19 centripetal acceleration so that means we're pointing towards the center if anything is directed towards point one so because the car is down here we need to point to the center and that's towards point c choice c which body is in equilibrium so that means constant velocity in the same direction and at rest okay satellite moving around earth in a circular orbit that's changing direction a cart rolling down a frictionless incline, so it's accelerating. Apple falling freely, also acceleration. A block sliding at constant velocity at a tabletop. That is true choice D. Okay, number 21. Gravitational force of attraction. We're thinking Newton's law of universal gravitation. So that's Fg, big G, equals M1 times m2 over r squared times big G. So g is a constant, so we need to look at the other two variables, mass and distance. To increase force, we got to do one of these two things. So for f to go up, increase, mass has to increase, whereas radius has to decrease. Looking at their locations in the reference in the equation, mass is a numerator, so it goes up, so it is force. If you're dividing by something in the denominator, then it's an inverse relationship. So looking at our choices, okay, doubling the mass of both objects would definitely increase it. Um, choice B, doubling the distance would decrease it, so that's not valid. C, doubling the mass of both objects and doubling the distance. That kind of cancels itself out if you work it out, dummy variables. And D, doubling the mass of one object and doubling the distance between the objects. That's going to decrease it overall too. So it's choice A, doubling the masses of both. Nothing happening to the distance. If you change that, then you run the risk of decreasing the force. Okay. 22, net force is zero. We need to look for the graphs that show when the net force is zero. So net force is zero when it's in equilibrium. Okay. So we need to see constant speed. And my pen's not working as well anymore. Constant speed or at rest. So none of these graphs show anything at rest. We need to show then constant velocity. So looking at our graphs on the right, it's easier to see which one shows constant speed because speed is on the y. So we can cross up A and C because looking at the second graph, both of them have constant speeds. Now between B and D, is it linear or exponential on a distance versus, versus time graph? And that's choice B. We're changing our distance at a constant rate, constant velocity. Okay, 23. Okay, our diagram here shows points A and points B for two satellites. Okay. We are comparing A to B. A has a normal radius R. B has twice the radius, so mass is the same, but R is changing. So we gotta use dummy variables. Okay, so we're gonna plug in easy numbers. Our mass is the same, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so our distance is R, so we're just going to put a 1 there because there's no coefficient, we're keeping it at 1. So Fg is equal to 1 for A. Now for B, we are doubling the distance, but everything else is the same. So what happens when we do that? 
fg becomes smaller at one fourth. So it's one fourth as great for b. The magnitude of the force between b and the planet is one fourth as great because it's further away. So remember, when you increase distance, increase r, then you weaken the force. That's what happens. Okay, number 24 is another dummy variable, but now we're dealing with more numbers here. The original force is 20 newtons. If the mass of each, both of them were doubling, then we have to figure out what is the new force. So everything is originally 1, but let's see what happens when we double each mass. So we're putting a 2 there for each of them. And we get the new force is 4 times as great. 4 times greater. Our original is 20, so 20 times 4 equals 80 newtons. And that's choice D. Alright, number 25. Gravitational forces differ from electrostatic forces. Oh, we didn't even talk about electrostatic yet, but gravitational, we should know, based on what we know already about gravity, is that it's always attractive, attractive only. Nothing of repulsive, it never pushes anything away, it always takes everybody in. Gravity loves everybody, and it's attractive. That sounded really weird. Okay, 26, moving on. Which object has the greatest inertia? So we need to make sure we know to equate inertia with mass. So greatest mass is choice D, regardless of speed. It's just mass. 27. A 25 newton horizontal force northward and another force southward act concurrently at the same time. That's what it means. On this object, what is the acceleration? So 25 going north, 35 going south, 15 kilograms is the mass. Okay, so net force here, 10 newtons, F equals MA to find acceleration, mass is 15. 10 divided by 15 will get us 0.67, less than 1. Choice A. Number 28. In which factor best represents the direction of the normal force? So normal force comes out of the surface, shooting outwards from the plane. And that's choice C. Notice how choice C is the one that shoots up out of the plane. And that's normal force. 29. A 50 newton horizontal force is needed to keep an object weighing 500 newtons moving at constant velocity. So we need to keep pushing with that to keep this object weighing that much, moving, constant. The magnitude of the frictional force is what? So constant velocity means it's balanced. Weight is 500 newtons, which means normal force is also 500. We are pushing 50 newtons, which means friction is also 50 newtons to keep it constant and balanced. So that is our answer choice C. Number 30. Which graph represents the relationship between the magnitude of the gravitational force and the distance? Okay. Distance is r, and we're looking at the relationship between f and r. So given that r is in the denominator with an exponent, this is an inverse square relationship. There's an exponent, denominator, so this is inverse square. One goes up, the other one goes down exponentially. 
so that's choice D. You're never going to see inverse and inverse squared together. They'll either give you one or the other, but when it comes to gravity, we're talking about inverse square relationship. Okay, 31. We're looking for the magnitude of force F if this thing is held at rest on a 30 degree incline with a 10 kilogram mass. So this is held at rest, so that means equilibrium. F is balanced out by FG parallel. Parallel meaning we need to think of sine. Sine goes down the incline. FG parallel equals FG sine theta. Because they gave us the mass in kilograms, we can't just use FG, we need to use MG sine theta. Okay. M is 10. We got to convert it to newtons by multiplying by 9.81 meters per second squared times sine of our angle 30 degrees. Okay. This should be about 49.05 newtons. That's choice B. Okay. And now we reach the final two questions of this entire practice exam. That was a doozy whopper. There's a lot of them. Whew. But at the least, thankfully, our actual IA is only 25 questions. So feel thankful for that. I just gave a lot of practice anyway. All right, number 32. Here we have three forces acting on a box as shown in the diagram below. If the box is at rest, we should think equilibrium, which means the net force here is equal to zero. Once it's at rest or in constant velocity, it's in equilibrium, net force is zero, acceleration is zero. Okay, number 33. Draw the direction of both the object's velocity and centripetal force acting on the object when it is in the position shown. So it's moving counterclockwise, as shown in the top arrow. Centripetal force, centripetal meaning towards the center, pointing this way. So this is F. Velocity is tangent, which means it's going up in a straight line. And that's it. And we reached the end of this practice exam. Hope that was helpful for you guys. Please ignore any weird ruffling sounds here and there. That is my fault. But other than that, everything should be okay. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And don't forget to pay attention to some weird things I wrote or said here and there. Anyway, good luck. Best of luck. Good night.